In today's video, we look at energy management for peak performance, and we introduce you to brain rule number three, challenge it. In this video, we look at stress and time management from an entirely new perspective, through the eyes of your brain. How you manage your energy, both mental and physical, has a huge impact on your performance. Today, let's focus on how you can use stress to your advantage. By doing so, you will become an executive athlete, maintaining a high level of performance and energy management throughout the day, the week and the working year. When I say the word stress, what do you think? Good or bad? If you're like most people, you'll say bad. But actually, we know that stress has two components. The bad stuff we call de-stress. The good stuff we call eustress. De-stress leads to a reduction in physical and or mental performance, whereas eustress actually increases physical and or mental performance. In fact, if we didn't have eustress, we wouldn't be productive at all. And we wouldn't, believe it or not, have a happy and engaged life. Stress is not all equal. Why would the same event stress somebody severely, but not stress somebody else? It's got to do with a few things. Firstly, is perception. Do I perceive this as a stress or a challenge to be met? Then, if you do perceive it as a stress, it's about coping skills. Do you have a default coping strategy for stress? Or do you try and deal with it when it comes? As we've heard in this previously, when you're stressed, the frontal lobes aren't working. Your ability to come up with a good stress management strategy is compromised. But the last thing and the holy grail of managing stress is resilience. Resilience is the ability to bounce back from adversity. As a Chinese proverb puts it, fall down seven times, get up eight. As it turns out, resilience is like inoculation. We have to be exposed to stress in order to become resilient. You don't read about resilience and have it. You must earn it. And you must earn it by a balance of stress and recovery. That is how you become a peak performer. Expose yourself to stress, frame it positively, but recover from it effectively. If we don't recover effectively, or if we don't have any resilience, we can enter what I call the stress vortex. And I use the concept of a whirlpool because the further down you get in this vortex, the stronger the downward pull becomes. And we've all been at the first level where we lose a little bit of focus. And we've all been at the second level, which is characterized by something called presenteeism. That's when you're at work, but you're not really there. Your mind is wandering off somewhere else, normally because you're stressed or unhealthy. It starts to get pretty serious when we get in to the next level where there's some anxiety there and we start to self-medicate with alcohol or drugs or comfort foods. And it gets very serious when we get down the next level into self-destruction. This would be where you're self-medicating with whatever it is, but it's totally out of control. Where you're drinking on your own or taking drugs on your own and especially doing these things when you know it is having a detrimental effect on your own health and your relationships. Here, it is extremely important that we get a strong intervention 
because the last level is depression. And we now know that a significant amount of depression in the Western world is caused by chronic, unmanaged distress. And this isn't a good place to be because depression is characterized by anhedonia. If we think of hedonism, which is engaging in the pleasures of the senses, anhedonia is the inability to feel pleasure. And the reason is that chronic distress burns out neurotransmitter systems that are to do with mood and pleasure. So it is vital that we learn to harvest eustress and seek out resilience if we want to be peak performers. To further understand stress and its big brother resilience, I want to take a perspective from an athlete, an endurance athlete training for a marathon or half marathon. If you've done this or know someone who's done this, you'll know how we train is that we stress our body. So in running a half marathon, a good way to stress the body is to go running. And as you train, you'll get more and more fatigued. And because performance is a function of fitness minus fatigue, over time, with training, you'll actually get worse. But at some point, you will stop, stop training, and your body will bounce back. That bounce back, the process of general adaptation in physiology is called super compensation. Our body bounces back stronger and faster after a rest. And you can see where that's going. Continued exposures to stress, some training, that overload, and then recovery allows us to keep improving. What an athlete might do, and I've done this, and you may know someone who's done this, is we can overtrain. So some training's good, more is better. So I keep training right past the point where I should have had a rest. And the sad part about that is when I stop, I do eventually bounce back, but my performance is no better than when I've started, after all that effort. I could commit the cardinal sin, and I did this once in my athletic career, is get to the stage of burnout. Some training is good, more's better, smashing yourself every day must be the way to go. And when you do that, not only don't you recover when you stop, it takes you several months to recover, and you may be worse than when you started. I want to turn that stress and adaptation for physical performance into stress and resilience, how we manage our mental health. Some stress in your life is good. Let me say that even more clearly. Stress is good. In fact, stress is essential for a happy and healthy life. Without stress, you can build no resilience to stress. Stress is the inoculation that builds our system up, that complex ecosystem that is our brain, body and mind. It adapts to stress to withstand stress. I would submit to you, there are some people in the world that are stressed out because they suffer no stress. I'm thinking particularly in my case of the old lady next door whose rubbish wasn't collected yesterday and the stress that that caused her from a relatively minor event. There's many of us who are suffering stress, but this stress is good, safe, normal part of humanity stress. But what we're not doing is recovering from that stress. And we need daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly strategies to move ourselves out of that stress and allow our body, mind, and brain to bounce back and be stronger than it was before. Resilience is earned. Back to athletics again, the major advances in athletic performance, especially endurance performance in the past two decades, have been of recovery, not of training itself. We've known since the late 1960s about the Lydia principles of long distance training and hard training. What we've learned recently is that we need to assist our bodies to recover better. And you'll see me, I'll go and do a hard workout and all of a sudden I'll be wearing the compression tights to drive the blood back to my heart. 
I'll be taking ice baths, I'll be doing hot and cold treatments, massages, the list goes on. The thing is, athletes train a lot and spend a lot of time trying to recover. Their performance might make up 5 or 10% of their total actual physical effort. To become an executive athlete, we can apply the same principles. Stress, recovery. And if your recovery techniques are the default watch TV and self-medicate with some beer, wine, drugs or cigarettes, then I would say to you, you need to think more carefully about recovering as hard as you, as hard as you train. Stress is essential, recovery is essential, stress is good, recovery is important. Okay, now let's look at how we can manage our energy throughout the working day. You may well have heard of something called a circadian rhythm or a circadian rhythm. You may well know that that is our 24-hour sleep-wake cycle. And it turns out that the brain actually regulates this cycle. Way back in the 1950s, two researchers called Abernetsky and Kleitman were studying sleep and they found that when we're asleep, that actually goes in cycles as well. These little cycles of 90 minutes where we go in different phases of sleep were called ultradian rhythms. From the Latin, ultra dies, many times a day. It turns out that when we're awake, our energy goes on an ultradian, or ultradian cycle as well. So every 90 minutes or so, we get peaks and troughs in our energy, which may explain why a lot of you will feel dips in energy throughout the day. Now the smart person, or the executive athlete, would take advantage of this and work in with the rhythms. But what we tend to do, particularly in the Western world, is we try to push on through those natural dips in energy either with adrenaline, the stress hormone, or we use things like caffeine or sugar to give us an energy burst. Whilst that can push us through, we know that with everything with the body, there's a payback. That is often why after lunch, and particularly later in the day, we are much less productive. And when we look at people who work like that, we find that their brainwave pattern gets into higher and higher beta state. That signifies arousal in the brain, and we know that with too much arousal, the brain starts dropping its performance. So the executive athlete would take breaks every 90 minutes, what I call a brain booster break. Get up, walk up and down the stairs, get blood flow and oxygen to the brain, come back, take a drink of water, have a healthy snack, and breathe deeply for a minute. That's probably a three to four minute break. It will bring your brainwave pattern right the way down. It's like taking your brain out and plugging it into the wall to recharge it. You decide if this is a good idea for you. So what have we found out today? Well, from your brain's point of view, stress can be both helpful and harmful, depending on your perception. Understanding your body's natural rhythms and having planned downtime and recovery strategies will allow you to achieve more in less time and perform at your best. Now remember, you can change your brain and ultimately change yourself. And remember, no one is coming to save you, but you can save yourself.